coming. Um, there will be a few more people showing up shortly, um, but we're very lucky today to have, you know, the first technical talk in our series with Idaho National Lab. A few weeks ago, we had John Wagner kind of give us an overview and kick, kick off this National Lab series. Uh, but today, um, we're lucky to have Tom Bosbele with us. Um, he's a staff scientist in their fuel design and development department. And uh, working closely in the Nuclear Materials Discovery and Qualification Initiative, or NMDQI, which I'm sure we'll hear him talk about, and we've been learning a lot more about here at UW as well. So um, I'll just hand it over to him and let him tell us about the challenges in design and qualifying new materials for advanced reactor. Go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's exciting to be able to have this uh, opportunity to speak to you guys. Um, about what we're doing at INL, um, especially in regards to uh, nuclear materials and uh, the development and qualification of those. Um, so, um, as uh, Paul just said, I'm, I work within the, new, the fuel design development group, so most of my work is involving the irradiation and characterization of nuclear fuels, um, mostly a lot of alloy fuels and generation four um, reactor fuel development. And a uh, component of that also has kind of brought me into the Nuclear Materials Discovery and Qualification Initiative. A uh, very kind of high level statement of what that is, is uh, it's kind of a grand challenge approach within the nuclear science user facility um, structure to uh, try to develop the, uh, the tools and methodologies needed in order to advance nuclear fuels in kind of a modern material science uh, paradigm. So, um, you know, some of the some of the background and motivation for this is the fact that nuclear materials are incredibly slow to qualify. Uh, so when you look at kind of a standard historical cycle for materials qualification, um, so that you can use it within a nuclear reactor, uh, we talk about this kind of 10-year cycle time frame, and you know, normally need something on the order of at least two or three cycles in this materials design process in order to, to get something deployed. Um, some of that is because it takes a long time to design and fabricate uh, these ex the experiments necessary in order to, to, to test the materials in a, a relevant environment. Um, irradiation times are inherently slow. There's not really good ways to speed it up. You're just kind of fixed. You know, you've got a reactor that provides a certain flux, and uh, there isn't exactly like a dial to turn to 11 when you're ready to go that fast. Um, and so you're kind of stuck to the, the whims of the reactor. And then once you get that done, you're still stuck for another three or five years or longer for post irradiation examination. Um, and so just for your first cycle, you're talking about a potential 10 year program. And so you're also stuck with a lot of the, uh, you know, continuity from, from high level program or high level kind of management, you know, Department of Energy Management funding, things like that. And it's, it's difficult to get those. And so, you know, if we're truly interested in actually delivering nuclear new materials to the nuclear energy um, needs, we've got to ask ourselves if we can qualify these materials in a faster way and do it and do this better in a more in a more modern material science approach. Um, and it's our opinion that we can, and we'll kind of discuss what that looks like later on. Um, so to start off with, um, why go faster? Why nuclear? Why is this needed? And you know, and I realize this is a nuclear engineering crowd, so a lot of us, I think, sometimes take for granted some of the reasons why we do this and maybe forget. Um, in some cases, we just started doing this because it's interesting. But the reality is, is there's some very significant problems in this world that we need to address, and most of those problems come back to uh, the availability of reliable electricity. In a general sense, by 2040, right, we're going to have over 9 billion people in the world. Um, that's our trajectory, and there's nothing indicating that that's going to change. Um, it could potentially even be higher, just, you know, there's, and ultimately that means we're going to have more electricity. And the, quali the basic quality of life, um, things like sanitation, things like water, things like, things like food, all of those require, require energy. And our energy, and the energy consumption per capita is a very good indicator of that quality of life. And from a human rights standpoint, that's something that we really need to understand, that everybody in this world deserves to have that. Um, and, that, and that has a lot of implications to a lot of things. We want an equitable society. We want, you know, women and girls to have the same potential future as, as men and boys do. Then um, we need to be able to provide them electricity because it's historic, you know, in a lot of, in a lot of, um, 
in a lot of developing societies, the responsibilities of cooking, cleaning, and other household work goes to the girls and the women. And the only opportunity they have to be able to study and make a better life for themselves is when they can turn the lights on. And if they can't turn the lights on because there's not electricity, then they don't have a better future. Um, and so those are things we have to consider. Um, from an environmental standpoint, it goes without saying that carbon is a huge problem. But if we look at the comparison, right, of, of nuclear power compared to every other um, energy source out there, we're orders of magnitude better in our carbon footprint uh, for grams per kilowatt, uh, kilowatt produced. And so combating carbon and actually reaching carbon neutrality, like, you know, all of our political candidates are trying to talk, to talk about things of that sort, like nuclear is the only option. Um, but we don't have time to wait because there's real consequences in 2030, there's consequences in 2040, and we don't have 30 years to qualify the material necessary to deploy the next generation of reactors. So those material designs, that comes back to material science problem. Um, so we look at the, the standard kind of material science te tetrahedron. Um, you know, we've, we've seen this and it's the, the premise of your introduction to material science classes. Um, it has to be considered. We have to look at all four of these components between processing, property, structures, and performance. Well, we maybe have to look at this a little bit different. We're going to revisit this throughout the, the duration of the talk, but a lot of our historical materials design have been, okay, we've got some structure, we've got some processing we're going to start. We can make an alloy by throwing in these metals and heating it up to this, and these are our fabrication methods. And from that, oh, look, we get some certain properties and some structure, um, and you will characterize this and we basically see how well it performs. And so this is evidenced kind of by the current materials we use in nuclear reactors. If we look at the core components that we have, none of them were really actually designed for nuclear performance. They were designed for other applications and we just kind of adopted them because they were convenient. Um, you know, if you look at stainless steel 316, if you look at any of the, you know, RPB steels, things like that, none of those were designed for nuclear applications. They just happened to work. Um, we haven't ever actually stopped and, and looked at the, we haven't been afforded the opportunity to look at a nuclear material from the perspective of performance and reserve, reverse solving it back to those other three components. Um, and some of that is, is basically the premise of what nuclear, the nuclear materials discovery and qualification initiative or NMDQI is trying to do. And that's predicated also on some of the successes from um, programs like materials genome initiative. And so Materials Genome Initiative was very successful in a variety of ways um, in engaging with, uh, with companies. Um, MGI was, was stood up in, I think, eight years ago, nine years, somewhere, somewhere during the middle of the Obama administration. Um, and, it, and it functioned on trying to correlate a lot of key material science areas together or combine them and have them work synergistically. Um, so talking about computational materials design, um, different data informatics frameworks and databases using advanced material or advanced manufacturing techniques and um, high throughput testing and characterization. Um, and, the, and those are those realized in a variety of different ways um, by different companies and successfully were able to, were to significantly improve the innovation rate for materials. Um, one, uh, one that I have a good appreciation for is, is Questech. And uh, they were able to use some of these tools from MGI to, to have an eight year from design to deployment process of an alloy for a hook shank on a, on a jet plane. So the hook shank is, is the big long arm that comes back and reaches and connects onto the, uh, the braking systems on an aircraft carrier, for, and particularly for the T-45, which is a training aircraft. And, and prior to working at the laboratory, I spent a number of years working in the nuclear Navy on aircraft carriers, being familiar with some of the, the aerospace things. And these are areas that have an, you know, fairly comparable uh, design requirements and qualification requirements to a nuclear material. And so if I can look at from an aerospace perspective where the, the liability of that hook and that material is, is the, the destruction of the plane and, and, and likely the death of that pilot, um, to go from, from a concept to deployment in eight years is fantastic. And that's something that we can capture in nuclear and something that we really need to capture in nuclear. So I mentioned this in the previous slide a little bit, but the path forward is, is four, kind of comes down to four facets, right? So we've got, from the very beginning, I like to think of this kind of computational materials design. We've got decades of material science data out there that likely lend themselves to 
to having a very good understanding of, of material Canada to nuclear applications. Um, you know, there, there's definitely going to be missing gaps, but there's probably the vast majority of the data that we need to qualify material probably already exists in various other material science areas, um, at least for the first iteration of a material. And so using some of these, uh, using a variety of computational methods, we should be, or um, in, in data frameworks, we should be able to take a lot of that data and have a much better understanding of compositional space, structure space, and being able to correlate those to different performance metrics that have been established in other areas and use that to start identifying candidate materials for the next generation of nuclear materials or that either currently exist or maybe don't exist yet and start making those kind of predictions using you know, from like a meta material standpoint. And that links back to um, all these other facets, physics-based modeling. A lot of that's going to be predicated on um, you know, multi-length scale, physics-based, uh, mechanistic informed models that can predict the performance of these materials. And that's going to be coupled too with our ability to fabricate it and to test it. And so this advanced manufacturing and high throughput testing and characterization becomes really important, especially when we start trying to identify new constitutive relationships for materials and their performance and how we can use that to start projecting into, into performance space and maybe buy ourselves kind of, you know, what I like to call qualification margin. Um, so kind of quickly hinting on some of these, uh, the designing of materials, um, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of data and a lot of information that already exists out here. So we look at some of the operating conditions, we can look at the current kind of operating space for a lot of material families, right? We can, we can see how high entropy alloys, traditional metal alloys, technical ceramics, metal glasses, all these things behave under certain temperatures, what sort of mechanical properties they have. Um, and we can start correlating those to say their, their microstructure, and we can start identifying the optimal microstructure for just the thermal mechanical demands of a nuclear core component, or a nuclear reactor core component. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there is the realization that there's, there's a lack of a radiation history for a lot of these things. We can use that and move that forward into kind of modeling these, these potentials and identifying, you know, High, high probability success candidates um, in scaling down our selection. So when we start considering you know, potential material families like a, a multi-principal element alloy or also sometimes known as a, a high entropy alloy, if I'm talking about a three to six element system, I might have two and a half million potential candidate materials out there. And obviously there's no feasible way for us to go test two million materials. And so these computational tools of performance and, and projecting uh, the performance of these from like a physics informed basis allows us to start scaling these down. And I'll, and I'll revisit this later when we talk about how we're actually executing this in a variety of ways. Um, and so the experimental validation we'll, we'll come back to. Um, I mentioned this before, um, the physics-based modeling is important. So at INL, we, we use what's you know, called our, our MOOSE framework. And I won't go into it too much because then Yang Fang will, will call me out for misstating it. But, We've got a lot of different tools that allow us to span a large number of different length scales. Um, it allows us to uh, start looking at a lot of the kind of um, performance uh, structure properties and um, processing relationships and making these predictions of how these materials are going to behave in a nuclear reactor. And the benefit to this is that as we start identifying these materials and we, and we start testing them, we can start revalidating these models. And, the, and the, as the cycle progresses, and especially if it's doing this kind of in real time, it enables us to start updating these models and making the next prediction you know, right away so we can immediately start into the next cycle without having to kind of wait for these, these decades of um, iterations. Um, with all of this, of course, there, we're, going to be, we're going to be handling large data sets from, from existing research or historical research, as well as bringing in large data sets from a lot of other uh, future research. And being able to adequately manage this is, is important. And so we're working at establishing a variety of um, data analytics and machine learning tools so that we can integrate um, the analysis from, you know, we start to get a lot of TEM analysis and start to automate the, you know, image capturing. We can start analyzing these right away and start you know, really intelligently thinking about what we're seeing in these TEM images and correlating it back to what we're seeing in some of the modeling efforts and start um, accelerating uh, the, basically the return, on, the, re, the return to the next cycle of, of R&D. 
Um, the, the third of the four components, the um, high throughput material fabrication, you know, we've, we've established in a lot of areas a lot of advanced manufacturing techniques. And the inevitable question that always arises when you try to bring new in, especially for nuclear, is, well, how does it behave in this new environment? How does it behave under irradiation? And a lot of these advanced manufacturing techniques do introduce a lot of new and novel kind of uh, microstructural problems. Um, you know, are you getting are you getting texturing a certain way? Are you getting preferential direction of your grains and whatnot because of how you're laying this down? What sort of heat treatments are you needed? Are you, and so forth. And all of these are very important to consider, especially when you're talking about, say, the radiation effects of materials and, you know, what sort of irradiation-induced growth or swelling or am I going to get, you know, what is the creep going to be under irradiation and so forth. Um, and so, and that's, and that's important. But, but the benefit of this is it also enables us to start asking those questions in a variety of ways because we, we're learning how to compositionally and structurally grade these materials. So those questions of how do these variations perform under irradiation, we can test a lot of those by using, by using some of these advanced manufacturing uh, techniques and to start being able to nail down, you know, what works, what doesn't, to be able to, you know, in, in very somewhat large swaths kind of push aside the ones that don't. Um, and, and this is especially true from a compositional standpoint. Um, and once again, I'll revisit this with some of the execution and how we started compositionally graded and testing cladding materials um, for various high entropy alloys. Um, so this is this is my this is where we get into what is a bit more of my my area of I guess expertise, and this is my my realm for NMDQI is the Testing and characterization. Um, so research efforts on testing, testing irradiated materials um, requires a lot of effort. And part of that, again, goes back to the fact that we were very limited to the component or the, the capacity of a reactor to perform a certain amount of irradiation in a certain amount of time, right? I can't, I can't change the neutrons per second that I get from, from the advanced test reactor at, or ATR here at INL. Now, to some extent, we can go and start doing ion, ion irradiation, but that gives me some very limited, very limited range of understanding this material and how it behaves because of penetration depths and so forth. And again, because it's not necessarily characteristic, again, of, of what we actually see in a reactor. And for any qualification that we're going to do, everything's going to come down to, did we put neutrons on it and what happened? And so we really need to start identifying ways that we can improve the irradiation testing throughput of both fissile and non-fissile materials, and most, and potentially most significantly, we need to we need to improve the way that we actually characterize these materials. And so we need to start developing multimodal data streams. And what I mean by that is we need to look at how can I get multiple streams of information that I need from a single instrument or from a single test, um, because if, if you've never worked with nuclear materials in a hot cell before. It's incredibly cumbersome and it's incredibly problematic. And so if I can spend less time looking at things I don't care about and less time having to transfer between different systems that I need in order to get the data necessary to understand what's going on, then we can significantly improve this process. Um, and we can significantly improve the rate of return of which, in, of which we can support the models, support the, the material design efforts, and support the qualification because we can focus on the areas that we really are interested in. And ultimately, this is going to enable us to start establishing correlative like property measurements with microstructure. So when I start seeing certain microstructures form after certain amounts of irradiation, and I see these certain properties and you know, or certain performance metrics, then I can start to say, I can qualify them, I can start qualifying a, a, a microstructure independent of maybe what my processing parameters were in order to get there. Um, and that's really crucial because if you've ever, if you've ever spent very much time looking at material qualification um, documents, you'll see that, okay, if I'm going to qualify this steel, then it's going to have to get cast at this temperature, it's gonna get processed at this temperature, you know, post heat treatment at this temperature in this time, it might be tempered one way or the other, it's gonna have certain, certain stresses built into it. And all of that is, is eventually leading it to, well, I've got this microstructure. But if that microstructure performs independent of, of, um, of manufacturing techniques, then the qualification process for that becomes much, much more 
easy and it becomes much more viable for an industry to start adopting because they don't have to consider as many of those variables. Um, and I think I kind of betrayed a little bit of this slide before, but ultimately the goal is rapid qualification. Um, you know, can we start can we start experimentally validating some of the models and some of the some of the predictions that we've gotten um, within one year and and being able to assess those and then project that out to ten years? Can I do ten you know two or three years of experimental work and validate a ten or thirty year design life um, or start creating you know high probability success you know margin and and convince the regulator that yes, I know we've only got three years of creep testing, but because this all matched our model and it's all physically based, I can accurately say up to 10 or 15 years that this is going to be the behavior that I should get. And that correlates back to some of the stuff that we have seen for 30 year timeframes. And the nice thing is in a lot of discussions that we've actually had with NRC personnel and whatnot, they're actually a lot more um, receptive to these notions than a lot of people might give them credit for. And so they're, you know, it's, it's encouraging because a lot of this is new and a lot of this has been accepted in a lot of other areas, just not nuclear. Um, and so we, we feel very confident going forward that this is something that we can, we can see and do. Um, so um, specifically, I'd like to talk a little bit more now, and that's kind of my, my high level summary of what we're doing in, in NMDQI. Um, more specifically, what we're doing in terms of testing and characterization, it's gonna be broken into, right now, radiation testing, and then we'll come into some of the characterization. So, for those of you um, who aren't familiar with, with the advanced test reactor at, um, at INL, a lot of what we do is what's called a, a drop-in capsule experiments. And so for NMDQI, we're working at developing what we call our irradiation system for high throughput data acquisition capsule, or the ESA capsule. And essentially, the way that the, the capsules work is, um, well, as first we'll get to, for ATR, um, on the right-hand side here, um, we've got the, the fuel components that kind of form this fun little clover uh, kind of shape or if, um, and that you know the flows around are various flux traps or if you're a material scientist you might look at that and say it's a, it's a FCC kind of structure right and so you've got these flux traps that form around here and then surrounding it you've got all of these control drums um, reflector drums and and whatnot and then dispersed throughout it you've got all these gray circles these little green circles and pink circles orange circles, all of those little circles are um, our test slots. And so they're, they're big cylinders that are about 40, roughly 48 inches long. Uh, they drop through the, core, the, the whole axial height of the core and we drop a bunch of um, experiments in. And those experiments are typically small little cylinders that fit up into a basket or interlock in some fashion and can be, you know, with a crane lifted in and out um, out of those positions. Um, ATR coolant then flows from the top to the bottom uh, throughout all of those channels um, and, you know, provides, you know, heat removal for them and uh, basically it. So each of those positions have a, a different flux profile. Uh, for our reactor, for ATR in general, uh, it, it has an average flux of around um, 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14 thermal and 10 to the 12 mostly 10 to the 13 flat fast, with the exception of a couple of positions, which in our case we're using where we can get up to about 10 to the 14 fast flux. And our position is right here in the middle. It's these little pink circles um, the, you know, just off of the center flux trap um, for each of these lobes. So the experiment design that we're gonna be taught, that, that I'm talking about in here is going to fit within this channel and you know the outer boundary of this of this blue ring here is the the wall of our channel. We call it they're the inner eight positions. That's what these are here. And this blue ring is basically the water that's going to be flowing through there. Inside of that it is going to be these two concentric capsules, the light gray and the, and the dark. Um, and in between those is a a small, roughly 50 micron uh, wide helium gap. Both of those capsules are being designed to be ASME pressure boundaries, which is significant because 
um, it, it affords us a certain level of credibility of, um, in terms of failure rates. And so it, it gives us the opportunity to put a lot of things that normally you wouldn't want to be putting in a reactor if you only had a single capsule, uh, which is historically how things are done. Um, and those are things that it might be reactive. So we can put large quantities of, say, very high temperature sodium. Uh, we can put molten salts and things of that sort inside of this. Um, and be able to test those in there with having to uh, consider the consequences of, of capsule breach and interaction with, piece, with the primary coolant water. Um, the purpose of this helium gap is a uh, basically a thermal break, essentially. So the, the temperature of the coolant water has an inlet of around 50 C and typically an out around 70 C. Uh, but for most of the reactor designs that we're looking at, we're talking about wanting to have cladding temperatures or, te you know, or material temperatures on the order of two or 300, 400 degrees C, maybe even all the way up for some of the high temperature gas applications of, you know, eight or 900 C. And so um, this gap can be filled with either helium or argon or, you know, various combinations of, the, of you know, some sort of inert noble gas. And that has very low thermal conductivity. So we... It insulates and keeps the inside very hot and while the outside is relatively cold. So this orange ring here essentially is the is what would be the boundary of our actual experiment. And that experiment could be a fueled experiment or a non-fissile kind of structural experiment. So we remember that, so we've got a, a volume here that's roughly 0.44 inches in diameter for, for our capsule. And so we're, we're approaching this from two different perspectives. One is that we need to be able to test non fissile materials. And two, we need to be able to test fissile materials. And both of those require um, a little bit of a different demand. So for the non-material test, non fissile material testing, um, we need to be able to look at a variety of different uh, things that will give us you know, microstructural characterization and mechanical property characters or character data. Because ultimately, what we need for the performance is thermal is, a, is this kind of coupled thermal mechanical problem. Um, how does it how does it behave under high temperature applications? How does it behave under high high load applications? And so, um, our sample holder here. This is a this is a cutout from a drawing from what's called the NSUF standard capsule. So if you're involved in the NSUF program, um, this is something you may be familiar with or maybe have seen. And we're, we're taking, taking it and kind of expanding its capability a little bit. But the takeaway is we've got these, this space here where we can have our um, SSG3 tensile dog bones. And we can load up about 40 of these within a single capsule. And so if you've got a large different number of materials that are going to have, say, varying, varying um, microstructure or composition um, or, or what have you, you, or if you just need statistics um, of, you know, of one composite of one type of material, um, we can put we can load up a lot of these and put these in various positions in the reactor, uh, or with the axial axial positions within the reactor to get a variety of different fluxes, um, and a variety of different temperatures. Some of the ways that we do the temperature control, if you see these little blue spacers, uh, these blue spacers can be made from a variety of materials, um, and based off of those compositions, can give us a variety of different um, types of gamma heating. Um, a variety of different types of, uh, yeah, sorry, gamma heating and therefore temperature, and then we can couple that with the, the gas and the heat, the gas gap to determine, um, you know, anywhere from you know, 200 C all the way up to 5 or 600 C. In addition to that, we've got, you know, TEM disks and some other, you know, smaller disks that we can use. Um, some of these also come with various sorts of monitors. And that's great because we can really quickly just take these out, pop them into an SEM, do some electron microscopy, um, pull some lamella, do some TEM microscopy. And, um, and these geometries are already fabricated such that they're very easy to be able to handle within a hot cell. And that's important because, hot, again, the bit, one of the biggest problems we have with doing post irradiation examination is just the handling of irradiated materials and neutron activated materials and such. And so ways to be able to facilitate easy handling and, and not needing to machine stuff um, is of tremendous value. Um, something else that's not in, seen in here is we're also designing a capsule that will hold um, some cylindrical compact tension specimens for crack propagation uh, tests and fracture toughness tests. 
And the last thing, which I think is really cool, are these what we call 2D um, nano melt wires. And essentially what these are are some inks that we have. We have some really, really interesting um, uh, inkjet printers that can print on a variety of geometries and, and directions. And we fabricate these inks using these nano, um, nanoscale uh, metals that are tuned to have different eutectics and different melting points based off of the compositions. And we can actually tune these to have in about 50 degree increments a melting temperature from between 250 all the way up to around 900 to maybe even up to 1,000 C. I can't remember exactly. But the benefit of that is we can actually print a lot of these, um, print these onto the, the material. And we call them 2D because they're roughly about 5 nanometers thick. And they can be printed anywhere from you know, 1 to 100 microns thick. And so we can kind of um, uh, hatch you know, a material, hatch the capsule with these different wires and be able to look, look at them afterwards, identify which ones melted, where they melted, and so forth. Um, and then use that back against our thermal analysis to kind of verify the actual temperatures that, the, that these were irradiated at. Um, so it gives us, you know, it's a, a very advanced passive monitoring um, method. So the second component of our irradiation testing is our fuel testing. And so this is what, what we're seeing here is um, a lot of information that's actually coming from the advanced fuels campaign that we're adopting into the NMDQI. And it's kind of this revised concept for doing, for doing fuel tests uh, specifically for fast reactor fuel in a thermal reactor that is much colder than you actually want it to be. Um, and so for ATR, we have this kind of standard capsule design where we have this outer capsule that's notionally stainless steel, and then we have you know, cladding and a fuel material in, in the inside. And for a fast reactor uh, fuel specimen, like a, a metal alloy fuel for an SFR, um, it would take me on the order of 10 to 12 years to get to uh, 30 atom percent burnup. And, then, and that's just to get to the burnup. I haven't even considered the design of the experiment to begin with. I haven't even considered PIE, and so I'm just I'm just 12 years in for irradiation, and and that's and that's not actually going to work for anybody. Um, so we needed to find ways to accelerate this, and this is actually one of the few ways we can take advantage of, of some of the physics in the reactor and actually kind of accelerate the burnup. Um, and the trick to that is essentially reducing the scale of the fuel. And so by reducing the scale of the fuel by one half, or we'll say a scaling factor alpha in this case one half, and look at the heat, the power density of my fuel, and say, okay, well based off of, if I assume an equivalent heat generation rate from, from a standard size to a, to a reduced scale size, and my radius is scaled by some factor A, then my, act, my heat generation rate is about one over alpha squared. And for alpha being one half, that means it's four times higher. Well, the time to reach a target burn up is inversely proportional to my heat. And so essentially my time to get to 30 atom percent burn up for a half, half size, radially half size scaled fuel pin is about one fourth the amount of time. So I should be able to go from about 12 years down to you know, about two and a half years. And and it turns out it turns out and I'll show some of the I guess in a second some of the actual times for it. it turns out that's true. Um, it works out really well that way. But the problem with scaling this down is that my capsule is out here and I need and I can't just scale this down and have you know a quarter inch long helium gap because it'll melt it'll melt my fuel and melt my capsule. So we introduced the second capsule and we, so we still have this this thin helium gap um, to, to provide insulation and then I thermally bond it with sodium. So I've got this kind of molten sodium bath that this sits in and then I've got this helium gap that's placed far away. And that's really advantageous because we've also had a lot of fabrication problems with some of the experiments. Um, so in all of these things we also we ultimately come down to some of our manufacturing limits. And our tolerance for any of the machining is roughly one thousandth of an inch, uh, which is about 25 microns. And so I can accurately machine things down to that. Um, however, if my tolerance is plus or minus 25 microns, but my design gap is 50 microns, it's not very hard to imagine a scenario where we've got a very large gap on one side, maybe 100 microns, and you know near zero on the other side, just because of some eccentricities and fabrication issues. So this is an image from the AFC-2A experiments where we actually had that problem. So we had a very large gap on this side, which is 
going to call our hot side and a cold gap or a smaller gap on this side, which is our cold side. Our hot side obviously melted the fuel and it melted the cladding. And this was in the reactor for the better part of about five years. And so when you spend an awful lot of money and millions of dollars on designing and putting in experiments and then five years later, pull it out and look at the cross section and find out that you just melted it, it's not, it's not a pleasant day. And so we need to improve the reliability of some of these experiments as well. And the trick to that is pushing this, this helium gap further away from our area of interest. Um, and, and, that's, and that's shown here by the, these thermal analysis plots. So if I look at the top one here, I've got, you know, this is my idealized scenario where I've got, I've got zero offset in my, in my cladding and my inner capsule relative to the outer capsule. So everything's uniform. But if I introduce a one, a one mil or 50 micron offset, you know, which is again, the, the fabrication tolerances for one component. Um, I end up with an increased gap on one side that's very noticeable compared to the reduced size gap on the other side. So my cold side, hot side, and that is exactly what we had going on up here. However, reducing the scale of this and pushing that gap further away and, and kind of neutralizing any internal eccentricities with the sodium, I end up with a one, a one mil or 50 micron offset for this size, and I really get almost no appreciable difference. The actual numbers on that are about a 120 degree delta from this side to here, and about a 14 degree delta from here to here. And, um, and, that's, and that's good because, it, again, it, it gives us a much, a much better comfort, much better reliability for these sorts of experiments. Um, one of the other problems with doing fuel experiments for fast reactor fuel or a lot of fuels and stuff in, in ATR and it being a thermal reactor or self-shielding issues. Um, and so what we would typically do for a lot of the fast reactor fuels, we'd first, you know, first analyze what does this fuel look like um, as is when it goes in. And so I've got this kind of power ratio, radial power ratio, and the red curve shows that we have a very obvious problem, about a six to one, change from my radial my radial power to the uh, from the, the periphery of my fuel to the center um, of my fuel and so the trick we do is we introduce these these cadmium baskets around the fuel it filters out the thermal neutrons and hardens the spectrum and this great this great plot is what I get when I introduce the cadmium and the problem with that is it also reduces the overall flux that I have by about a factor of two um, because and you know, on one hand, that's fine because we're looking at fast reactor fuels. We want to see what fast fissions look like. And so we don't want to, you know, the, the thermal fissions introduce a potential um, variable that we may not want to see. But it takes us 12 years. So if I look at a full diameter um, fuel specimen um, in a pretty high flux zone with a cadmium basket, um, I'm getting about 0.7 atom percent burn up for 55 day ATR cycle. And it takes me 11.7 years, right? So I've got 12 years assuming no any, you know, extra outages or anything like that or anomalies in the reactor operation. Well, if I scale the fuel down to a smaller, smaller diameter, one, I burn it faster. Um, as you can see here, this is, this is with um, in a small eye, which has about half the overall flux of a small B. Um, and it takes me three and a half years to get to, or sorry, I get three and a half percent PR cycle here. If I go to a one third diameter, I get just over five percent. You really can notionally get to you know 30 atom percent for some very high burnout fuel tests in two and a half, you know, anywhere between one and a half to two and a half years. The other benefit is I can also take away the cadmium basket because this whole shielding effect essentially gets thrown inward by the reduction of the size of the fuel, and I end up with a power profile that's pretty comparable to what I get with the cadmium basket. Again, it's not idealized to you know, what we get in an actual fast test reactor, but if I've got an extra eight years of time to think about that intelligently, then I, it, at least it is, in our opinion, we've, we've made an improvement. We can burn this in two, in two years, and we can spend eight years doing PIE and analysis before we ever would have even gotten it out of the reactor otherwise. And the same actually holds true in an even better sense for, for UO2. So if I'm looking at some of the ceramic fuels and whatnot, I can reduce the size and, may, and actually have a lower heat generation rate than I would have for a full diameter fuel. I don't have to go to the very high enrichment, so I'm still operating in an LEU regime. And I'm getting 60 gigawatt days in five cycles, which is about two years all in all. So they've kind of changed some of their scheduling, so it's about three years per cycle um, versus the you know 12, year, 12 cycles that it would have taken me otherwise. And the nice thing is my beginning of life and end of life power piles are virtually identical. And so 
As far as accelerating the fuel irradiation and being able to start getting that through the reactor quicker, we're in a much better position. Um, um, got about 10 more minutes and quite a few things to get through, so I'll try to hurry it up a little bit. So this is where we're going to come back to talking about some of those HEAs and the advanced manufacturing and whatnot. So we've started looking at a variety of the alloys for cladding applications. And so using cryogenic milling and some SPS techniques, we're able to compositionally grade our materials. And so if you look at here, this is an ASCAS ingot. You can kind of see this like different kind of colored zone here. On the bottom and the top here, I, I compositionally have an HT9 pyritic mark steel. And on the inside here, I've got a variety of different high entropy alloys. These alloys are then cut. Um, this is kind of a nice cartoon to represent that. So I've got these different alloys that kind of get put into this fuel zone, and this gets put into here, and this is my capsule. So I've got one fuel pin here, one fuel pin there, and both of those have four different compositions within the cladding across my fuel zone. Um, just a little representation. This is a this is an actual fast uh, fast pin um, that goes inside here, so it's roughly two inches long, about 0.15 inches in diameter. And so we can take these and, and fabricate some, some compositionally graded materials. Um, I'm going to skip this and maybe come back to it later if you need to. I thought I had, oh. It's not showing. Oh, it's on the side here. I apologize. Sorry. So what these actually look like, if you see here on the right, these are some X-ray CT plots of these compositions. And so I've got one, two, Three, four, one, two, three, four. Um, it's one, two, three, four different materials um, here. And so these are three different three different rodlets that we, we're looking at, um, all again with different compositions across it. So we can get a lot higher, um, a lot more data coming out of a given test. Um, so real quickly, this is kind of a, of a variety of some of the fuel the fuel tests that are going on. Um, not necessarily just within NMD2I, but just some perspectives of a lot of the things that we're looking at um, in, our, in our current matrix, in our, in our phase two matrix for fuel development, um, and being able to use some of these accelerated techniques. Um, and obviously, most of these are, are bent toward the alloy fuels, a lot for SFR, serving fast reactor compositions. Um, but there's also a lot of the advanced cladding that we're looking at. Um, so we're going to be doing some 14 YWT ODS, um, some MPAs. Um, we're going to the the next iteration of the of them are going to be looking at a lot of uranium carbide fuel for some high temperature gas uh, reactors with silicon uh, carbide, the six sick cladding, um, some very interesting high KUO2, um, uh, high sorry high thermal conductivity uh, UO2 uh, tests and as well as some additional kind of um, dispersion fuels and things like that. So, um, so the last 10 minutes, um, so I want to leave, leave time for questions. I hate it when someone goes over and leaves time for like one question is materials characterization. Um, and so I mentioned this before, but hot cells are horrible. Um, I mean, they're necessary, but they're horrible to work in. And this is kind of a, right here, kind of a, a, a little cartoon to demonstrate the complexity of receiving a sample before you've even done a single microscope or put it in a single microscope. We're going to get it, we're going to look at it, take a picture, sample, transfer it to another another bay, we're going to transfer it to another bay, we're going to sit there and you know iterate this visual, visual examination, we're going to sample it for profilometry, we're going to iterate it through this through this cycle, we're going to sample it to or transfer say gamma spec and iterate it through this and, and so forth, right? And all of these, you know, all of these take an awful lot of amount of time. They're not quick and not easy. If you've ever had to operate a manipulator arm, you know that this is not a simple task. It's it's very very grueling, um, and this can take us the better part of months sometimes just to get from receiving the sample in the hot cell, just getting it prepared to go put inside of a microscope. And so we're working at developing a lot of advanced non-destructive techniques, a lot of multi-length scale property measurements. Um, correlative data capture and meaningful data in order to help get ultimately meaningful data sets so that this process isn't wasted. And I say that because a lot of times we get a material in there, you cross section it, you don't necessarily know where to cross section it, so you just take your best guess and then you then you mount it in a stub and then you go put it in SEM and you take kind of these big, maybe some big optical measurements first or images first, then put it in the SEM, take some images there and kind of 
I would say semi-arbitrarily go pull out some lamella and some APT tips and go do a bunch of testing. And there's no real confirmation of whether or not you actually sampled the best portion of the, of the material that you needed to. You didn't no confirmation whether or not that was the best place to take a lamella from or what areas of are interesting other than kind of just the best expertise, the best judgment. And the unfortunate reality too is that the best judgment of those are probably from people who aren't actually operating the instruments and aren't actually doing those jobs, right? The people who understand that best probably are sitting in an office and directing the program, and the people who don't quite have the expertise to really just look at it and know are the people operating those instruments. So we need ways to be able to better assess that and better drive those work processes. So one of the first things we're doing with that is what we call is the Hydra SEM. So the Hydra is, this, is a project to kind of build in a really high-end um, SEM fib that includes a variety of uh, characterization techniques. And this kind of goes to this multimodal instrument uh, approach. One of the things we're trying to develop for this is introducing um, it's kind of a first-of-a-kind thermal reflectance technique within an SEM. I apologize, my dogs are barking. Um, so, um, essentially what a thermal reflectance technique is, is the, is the use of two different lasers, one that we call a pump laser, one we call a probe laser. Uh, one is measuring the reflectance, the other one is delivering heat, and the change in that reflectance is a characteristic of the material properties as a function of temperature. And so you can use these to generate uh, thermal, um, thermal conductivity measurements, and we've actually started developing ways to be able to use this to measure um, measure elastic tensor properties or components. And so by using these lasers in this kind of non-contact, non-destructive way, we can assess two of the most critical areas of, of, of material performance in a nuclear, nuclear reactor is the thermal mechanical properties. And so this original picture here, this is the apparatus that was set up to kind of design what we call our thermal conductivity microscope, which is in the Radiation Materials Characterization Laboratory here at INL, which is really awesome. It's a fantastic tool, but that is way too big to fit inside of an SEM. And so we kind of have a first go effort at taking all of this, which is roughly about two feet long, and reducing it to this three, three inch um, wide component that is going to get mounted inside of this SEM. And so some of the first pass information that we get on this is actually really, really good. So when we're doing these measurements, what we want to get is we want to try to is to try to get a response that is as close to say this pink this pink profile as possible, right? The, or, and ideally a perfect step function. And the closer you get to that, the the better um, the better your error is and whatnot. And so our first our first go on this, we have a lot of our our model data points that we get from what our thermal conductivity on a, on a material should be, and it's actually very close to what our actual experimental data is. And so right now in our, in our first pass in this, we're getting roughly 12% error on either side of what that thermal diffusivity should be. And there's some, and there's some things we're doing that, that should allow us to be able to bring that down to a plus or minus like 5%, which is really good because that kind of puts, a, that puts this instrument the same, that same error margin of what you get from any other traditional thermal conductivity measurement um, that you're going to see in literature. And the benefit of this is we can put the material in raw and using some of the um, the tools that are in the, the, uh, the FIB, we can actually implant various metals on there in order to improve some of the reflectivity. Um, so uh, implanting gold, implanting platinum on the instrument, which is necessary for this, for this technique to go for. So our sample preparation and sample analysis and sa um, can all be built into a single instrument that also comes with it in real time in imaging. Um, so imaging via you know, standard microscopy images, EBSD, um, and EDS, and so we can correlate all of these properties, my thermal and mechanical and chemical and structural properties, all together in one big cross-section for material and, and put that all in one data stream. And so um, it's, it's a very exciting proposition. The second area of characterization that we're looking at is um, what we call answers. It's the application of non-destructive combinatorial examination of radioactive specimens. Um, Essentially, it's an integration of neutron tomography, X-ray computed tomography, and gamma emission tomography. All three things, all three of these areas are independently worked at right now, but there isn't a good way to actually correlate them together. The benefit of being able to correlate them together is it allows us to start mapping both spatially and chemically what's going on inside of a fuel pan. And for a lot of applications, especially for, 
for fuel applications, this is really this is of significant importance. And this goes back to the, the question of, well, where do I take a cross section at? What portion of this fuel pin do I go and mount? And for, and for a, a question like FCCI, that's really important because I can take an entire fuel pin and if I cut in the wrong place, I everywhere where I cut, I lose data. Never, and if I cut in the wrong spot, I lost important data or maybe I spent all of my time preparing a piece that really wasn't ideal. So I can take a fuel pin directly out of ATR, I can put it into all three of these techniques, correlate all the information together, and it allows us about a five micron resolution to start chemically and, spati and spatially mapping the entire fuel pin and the cladding, and allows us to kind of start unwrapping this. And so, and, that, and that's the, I should say that's the goal. We haven't, we haven't finished that. But the goal is to do that so we can start looking at things like FCCI, and I can go and look at my fuel pin and say, okay, this is the portion here that I've got a lot of chemical degradation on, right? I've got, I've got this eutectic forming here. I've got some lanthanide penetration here and so forth. So that actually and radially, this is where I want to take my cross-section at to go put into advanced characterization. And so that starts, starts improving our overall quality of data rather than just taking 12 cross-sections across the entire length of, of the pin and looking at all of them and then having to go through and analyze individually each one and whether or not that was, bought, that was worth going through. So the overall kind of future outcome for this is we're working at trying to establish some rapid qualification capabilities to start linking some of the microstructure um, in the fuel, to, in, in the materials, to the actual properties of the materials and having all of this being kind of ground in basic material science. Um, you know, looking at, looking at a large variety of different materials libraries and identifying ways that we can start, um, start predicting and, and picking out which materials we want. If we can start identifying various metamaterials and using advanced manufacturing techniques to start making them real. And then using some of these high, you know, these high throughput, um, you know, testing and characterization methods to really start understanding the actual properties and bring that back around to reinform this materials library in the original structure. Um, the plan going forward right now, some of the actual materials we're looking at is trying to basically duplicate a lot of existing ASME materials, right? So, for example, alloys um, 800H and um, you know 316L are both alloys that are that are ASME qualified to use within a new um, new applications, and we're going to basically try to duplicate within a span of three years the same data set necessary to qualify those and basically present a a requalification of these materials. Um, and basically use that as a framework with existing materials as, as a, a, the pathway to start um, qualifying some of these new advanced materials. I think I ran over a little bit, and I apologize, um, but if there's any questions, I'd love to take them. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Boone. Um, if we were all together, everyone would be clapping marvelously at your excellent presentation, um, but you'll just have to go with my voice instead. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Does anyone have any? You can feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat window. Go ahead, so, Young Thing. Yeah, Bong, I have a quick question. Um, the microstructure based qualification seems very exciting, and also it's encouraging to hear that the uh, regulators are interested in that. But the, then there's a big challenge is about um, since Microstructure is really the key thing here. So how to really quantitatively define a microstructure of a piece of material, right? Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, that, is a, that is a really difficult question. What defines microstructure? How do you actually characterize that and so forth? Um, and to some extent in this, the thi one of the things that we're, ch we're challenged with in, in this um, is, and I'm going to kind of go kind of around what to answer this is identifying what our material ontologies are, and basically identifying what the relationships of these different data streams are. And a lot of that, and, that, and that's part of the big lift in the materials analytics and the and the framework for that is making sure that we have a good understanding of what those data streams look like and how they relate back, and so we can actually understand that. Um, and and that's one of it is one of the big challenges in all of this. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you. I can't define to you what that microstructure looks like yet. Um, but, but yes, it is a very difficult proposition. Um, and 
you know, one of the things we're trying to leverage off, it, to some extent, the, a lot of what the AGR program has been doing with the with their uh, a radiation test is kind of statistically providing kind of a basis for that, right? So um, we look at the advanced gas detector, the TRISO program, and how they're trying to test this. You know, the AGR 456 irradiations, or 567, I um, apologize, mixing them up. I think it's 456. Um, you know, that's, that is essentially going and saying we're getting the same performance independent of, for some of these different um, kernels independent of the manufacturing process. And so it's going back and saying, look, we can statistically quant or, you know, statistically take credit for the overall composition and structure of the material independent of how I necessarily fabricated it. Um, and it's kind of the same approach that we're, we're kind of trying to take, just from a little bit more of a, a physics-informed basis. Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. Yeah, thanks. Maybe one quick question for me. So you talked about a lot of the benefits of the smaller rodlets. Are there what yeah. are the what are the downsides to going to the smaller? Uh, those are, I love talking about those actually. Um, there's a lot of downsides. Well, and I, and I and I. And it sounds very, really cliche, but I think it's one of those opportunities to take advantage of, of the weaknesses. On the outset, the downside is that you've got um, you got very non-prototypic um, temperature gradients, right? So I've still got the same cladding same peak cladding temperature, and I've got almost the same centerline temperature. So I've got twice the steep of a, of a temperature gradient. Um, my surface to volume ratios are thrown out of whack, and so as far as looking at things like concentration. Um, ratios and, and um, diffusion characteristics and stuff, they're, they're not the same. Um, there's uh, non-prototypic fission products, and, and there's a variety of other things in there that ultimately um, aren't going to let me say I can qualify this fuel from a, from a reduced fuel standpoint. That being said, in correlating this a lot back to our physics-based our physics -based models or that, we're, that we've been working very hard at developing, you know, these are all validated against like 13,000 EBR2 pins that are all like U10 ZERC, right? So I've got 13,000 single data, you know, iterations of one data point that I've validated a lot of these physics-based models from. We're able to start putting these into a large, a, a much wider band of operational parameters as well as design parameters that, in, in my opinion and in the opinion of several others, that affords us a much better opportunity to validate some of these models which gives them a lot higher credibility when you start predicting them into additional space. Um, and the other aspect of it too, from a qualitative standpoint, we're doing an awful lot of controls. And so if I, if I already know the behavior of like a U10 zirconium, HT9 pin and EBR2, and I'm gonna go introduce a bunch of additives and some different you know, annular field geometry with no sodium or something, I can put two of these in the same capsule, irradiate them, and then I can go put them in some post-irradiation furnace testing and so forth and get some qualitative comparisons at different temperature excursions and whatnot that, you know, knowing one behaves better than the other, and I know the other is representative of what I've historically been doing, it gives me a better basis to go forward and maybe do like an LTA um, and start doing um, actual test assemblies uh, or full test assemblies of a given design. Great. Sounds good. Well, thank you again. I think our time's up. Um, it was great to have your talk, and um, we look forward to opportunities to collaborate in the future. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. Bye for I now. I assume that you have my contact information if anybody that's been distributed or can, if anybody has questions. Yeah, if anyone's here and has any questions, um, they can get in touch with Boone through myself or Tim Jensen. We have contact info. So. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Have a good